Section 43 of the Expedition of Humphrey Clinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Geeson. The Expedition of Humphrey Clinker by Tobias Smollett. Section 43. To Sir Watkin Phillips of Jesus College, Oxford. Dear Watt, the farce is finished, and another piece of a graver cast brought upon the stage. Our aunt made a desperate attack upon Barton, who had no other way of saving himself but by leaving her in possession of the field, and avowing his pretensions to Liddy by whom he has been rejected in his turn lady griskin acted as his advocate and agent on this occasion with such zeal as embroiled her with mistress tabitha and a high scene of altercation passed betwixt these two religionists who might have come to action had not my uncle interposed they are however reconciled in consequence of an event which hath involved us all in trouble and disquiet you must know the poor preacher humphrey clinker is now exercising his ministry among the felons in clerkenwell prison a postilion having sworn a robbery against him no bail could be taken and he was committed to jail notwithstanding all the remonstrances and interest my uncle could make in his behalf all things considered the poor fellow cannot possibly be guilty and yet i believe he runs some risk of being hanged upon his examination he answered with such hesitation and reserve as persuaded most of the people who crowded the place that he was really a knave and the justice's remarks confirmed their opinion exclusive of my uncle and myself there was only one person who seemed inclined to favour the culprit he was a young man well dressed and from the manner in which he cross-examined the evidence we took it for granted that he was a student in one of the inns of court he freely checked the justice for some uncharitable inferences he made to the prejudice of the prisoner and even ventured to dispute with his worship on certain points of law my uncle provoked at the unconnected and dubious answers of clinker who seemed in danger of falling a sacrifice to his own simplicity exclaimed in the name of god if you are innocent say so no cried he god forbid that i should call myself innocent while my conscience is burthened with sin what then you did commit this robbery resumed his master no sure said he blessed be the lord i am free of that guilt here the justice interposed observing that the man seemed inclined to make a discovery by turning king's evidence and desired the clerk to take his confession upon which humphrey declared that he looked upon confession to be a popish fraud invented by the whore of babylon the templar affirmed that the poor fellow was non compos and exhorted the justice to discharge him as a lunatic you know very well added he that the robbery in question was not committed by the prisoner the thief-takers grinned at one another and mr justice buzzard replied with great emotion mr martin i desire you will mind your own business i shall convince you one of these days that i understand mine in short there was no remedy the mittimus was made out and poor clinker sent to prison in a hackney coach guarded by the constable and accompanied by your humble servant by the way i was not a little surprised to hear this retainer to justice 
bid the prisoner to keep up his spirits for that he did not at all doubt that he would get off for a few weeks confinement he said his worship knew very well that clinker was innocent of the fact and that the real highwayman who robbed the chaise was no other than that very individual mr martin who had pleaded so strenuously for honest humphrey confounded at this information i asked why then is he suffered to go about at his liberty and this poor innocent fellow treated as a malefactor we have exact intelligence of all mr martin's transactions said he but as yet there is not evidence sufficient for his conviction and as for this young man the justice could do no less than commit him as the postilion swore point-blank to his identity so if this rascally postilion should persist in the falsity to which he is sworn said i this innocent lad may be brought to the gallows the constable observed that he would have time enough to prepare for his trial and might prove an alibi or perhaps martin might be apprehended and convicted for another fact in which case he might be prevailed upon to take this affair upon himself or finally if these chances should fail and the evidence stand good against clinker the jury might recommend him to mercy in consideration of his youth especially if this should appear to be the first fact of which he had been guilty humphrey owned he could not pretend to recollect where he had been on the day when the robbery was committed much less prove a circumstance of that kind so far back as six months though he knew he had been sick of the fever and ague which however did not prevent him from going about then turning up his eyes he ejaculated the lord's will be done if it be my fate to suffer i hope i shall not disgrace the faith of which though unworthy i make profession when i expressed my surprise that the accuser should persist in charging clinker without taking the least notice of the real robber who stood before him and to whom indeed humphrey bore not the smallest resemblance the constable who was himself a thief-taker gave me to understand that mr martin was the best qualified for business of all the gentlemen on the road he had ever known that he had always acted on his own bottom without partner or correspondent and never went to work but when he was cool and sober that his courage and presence of mind never failed him that his address was genteel and his behaviour void of all cruelty and insolence that he never encumbered himself with watches or trinkets nor even with bank-notes but always dealt for ready money and that in the current coin of the kingdom and that he could disguise himself and his horse in such a manner that after the action it was impossible to recognize either the one or the other this great man said he has reigned paramount in all the roads within fifty miles of london above fifteen months and has done more business in that time than all the rest of the profession put together for those who pass through his hands are so delicately dealt with that they have no desire to give him the least disturbance but for all that his race is almost run he is now fluttering about justice like a moth about a candle there are so many lime twigs laid in his way that i'll bet a cool hundred he swings before christmas shall i own to you that this portrait drawn by a ruffian heightened by what i myself had observed in his deportment has interested me warmly in the fate of poor martin whom nature seems to have intended for a useful and honourable member of that community upon which he now prays for subsistence it seems he lived some time as a clerk to a timber merchant whose daughter martin having privately married was discarded and his wife turned out of doors she did not long survive her marriage and martin turning fortune hunter could not supply his occasions any other way than by taking to the road 
in which he has travelled hitherto with uncommon success he pays his respects regularly to mr justice buzzard the thief catcher general of this metropolis and sometimes they smoke a pipe together very lovingly when the conversation generally turns upon the nature of evidence the justice has given him fair warning to take care of himself and he has received his caution in good part hitherto he has baffled all the vigilance art and activity of buzzard and his emissaries with such conduct as would have done honour to the genius of a caesar or a turenne but he has one weakness which has proved fatal to all the heroes of his tribe namely an indiscreet devotion to the fair sex and in all probability he will be attacked on this defenceless quarter be that as it may i saw the body of poor clinker consigned to the jailer of clerkenwell to whose indulgence i recommended him so effectually that he received him in the most hospitable manner though there was a necessity for equipping him with a suit of irons in which he made a very rueful appearance the poor creature seemed as much affected by my uncle's kindness as by his own misfortune when i assured him that nothing should be left undone for procuring his enlargement and making his confinement easy in the meantime he fell down on his knees and kissing my hand which he bathed with his tears oh squire cried he sobbing what shall i say i can't no i can't speak my poor heart is bursting with gratitude to you and my dear dear generous noble benefactor i protest the scene became so pathetic that i was fain to force myself away and returned to my uncle who sent me in the afternoon with a compliment to one mr mead the person who had been robbed on blackheath as i did not find him at home i left a message in consequence of which he called at our lodgings this morning and very humanely agreed to visit the prisoner by this time lady griskin had come to make her formal compliments of condolence to mistress tabitha on this domestic calamity and that prudent maiden whose passion was now cooled thought proper to receive her ladyship so civilly that a reconciliation immediately ensued these two ladies resolved to comfort the poor prisoner in their own persons and mr mead and i squired them to clerkenwell my uncle being detained at home by some slight complaints in his stomach and bowels the turnkey who received us at clerkenwell looked remarkably sullen and when we inquired for clinker i don't care if the devil had him said he here has been nothing but canting and praying since the fellow entered the place rabbit him the tap will be ruined we han't sold a cask of beer nor a dozen of wine since he paid his garnish the gentlemen get drunk with nothing but your damned religion for my part i believe as how your man deals with the devil two or three as bold hearts as ever took the air upon hounslow have been blubbering all night and if the fellow ain't speedily removed by habeas corpus or otherwise i'll be damned if there's a grain of true spirit left within these walls we shan't have a soul to do credit to the place or make his exit like a true-born englishman damn my eyes there will be nothing but snivelling in the cart we shall all die like so many psalm singing weavers in short we found that humphrey was at that very instant haranguing the fellows in the chapel and that the jailer's wife and daughter together with my aunt's woman win jenkins and our housemaid were among the audience which we immediately joined i never saw anything so strongly picturesque as this congregation of felons clanking their chains in the midst of whom stood orator clinker expatiating in a transport of fervour on the torments of hell denounced in scripture against evil-doers 
comprehending murderers, robbers, thieves, and whoremongers. The variety of attention exhibited in the faces of those ragamuffins formed a group that would not have disgraced the pencil of a Raphael. In one it denoted admiration, in another doubt, in a third disdain, in a fourth contempt, in a fifth terror, in a sixth derision, and in a seventh indignation. As for Mistress Winifred Jenkins, she was in tears, overwhelmed with sorrow, but whether for her own sins, or the misfortune of Clinker, I cannot pretend to say. The other females seemed to listen with a mixture of wonder and devotion. The jailer's wife declared he was a saint in trouble, saying she wished from her heart there was such another good soul like him in every jail in England. Mr. Mead, having earnestly surveyed the preacher, declared his appearance was so different from that of the person who robbed him on Blackheath, that he could freely make oath he was not the man. But Humphrey himself was by this time pretty well rid of all apprehensions of being hanged, for he had been the night before solemnly tried and acquitted by his fellow prisoners, some of whom he had already converted to Methodism. He now made proper acknowledgments for the honour of our visit, and was permitted to kiss the hands of the ladies, who assured him he might depend upon their friendship and protection. Lady Griskin, in her great zeal, exhorted his fellow prisoners to profit by the precious opportunity of having such a saint in bonds among them, and turn over a new leaf for the benefit of their poor souls, and that her admonition might have the greater effect, she reinforced it with her bounty. While she and Mistress Tabby returned in the coach with the two maidservants, I waited on Mr. Mead to the house of Justice Buzzard, who, having heard his declaration, said his oath could be of no use at present, but that he would be a material evidence for the prisoner at his trial, so that there seems to be no remedy but patience for poor Clinker, and indeed the same virtue or medicine will be necessary for us all, the squire in particular, who had set his heart upon his excursion to the northward. While we were visiting honest Humphrey in Clerkenwell prison, my uncle received a much more extraordinary visit at his own lodgings. Mr. Martin, of whom I have made such honourable mention, desired permission to pay him his respects, and was admitted accordingly. He told him that, having observed him at Mr. Buzzard's a great deal disturbed by what had happened to his servant, he had come to assure him that he had nothing to apprehend for Clinker's life, for if it was possible that any jury could find him guilty upon such evidence, he, Martin himself, would produce in court a person whose deposition would bring him off clear as the sun at noon. Sure, the fellow would not be so romantic as to take the robbery upon himself. He said the postillion was an infamous fellow, who had been a dabbler in the same profession, and saved his life at the Old Bailey by impeaching his companions, that being now reduced to great poverty, he had made this desperate push to swear away the life of an innocent man in hopes of having the reward upon his conviction, but that he would find himself miserably disappointed, for the justice and his myrmidons were determined to admit of no interloper in this branch of business, but that they would find matter enough to shop the evidence himself before the next jail delivery. He affirmed that all these circumstances were well known to the justice, and that his severity to Clinker was no other than a hint to his master to make him a present in private, as an acknowledgment of his candour and humanity. This hint, however, was so unpalatable to Mr. Bramble, 
that he declared with great warmth that he would rather confine himself for life to london which he detested than be at liberty to leave it to-morrow in consequence of encouraging corruption in a magistrate hearing however how favourable mr mead's report had been for the prisoner he is resolved to take the advice of counsel in what manner to proceed for his immediate enlargement i make no doubt but that in a day or two this troublesome business may be discussed and in this hope we are preparing for our journey if our endeavours do not miscarry we shall have taken the field before you hear again from yours j melford london june eleventh end of section forty three